Good evening. Glad to see all of you here tonight. We were just talking ahead of time. I guess tonight is uh, maybe the 10th uh, chess fest we've had, but I'll let our next uh, speaker tell you a little bit more about that because he knows the complete history. Uh, Tom Cook from the uh, library, uh, McDermott Library, is going to tell you a little bit about the history of this program and how it's developed, the uh, chess fest, chess educator here. Tom Cook. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm here uh, on behalf of uh, Ellen Safely. And Ellen is the new uh, director of library. She's been here 25, 30 years and has moved up the ranks. She's a very accomplished librarian. Um, and it was Dr. Safely who 10 years ago, uh, when we had this emerging uh, chess team and they were becoming known across the country and internationally, and, and uh, we sensed around the campus that um, a lot of the students didn't realize what we had, so we said, uh, why didn't the library go with the, the chess program and have uh, some events and showcase our, our players on the chess team and the chess club? So uh, that was the beginning of Chess Fest, and it's been 10 years ago, like, like Jim said. I can't believe. But uh, it's, uh, it, we, we went to see Dr. Tim Redmond, of course, and, and did that event uh, 10 years ago. And so... I think over the years it has enlightened the campus, and I don't think we have to really enlighten them much anymore. Uh, it's quite a well-known uh, uh, part of this university now, but we still like to have Chess Fest and, and have the, uh, the event like we had yesterday at the Chess Plaza with the gigantic uh, chess pieces now, and that's quite a spectacle. Um, a few years into the Chess Fest, uh, Dr. Redmond said, well, what can we do to, to, to get a little more exposure on chess education? And I said, oh, some of the organizations I've been with, they, they, we have awards. And he didn't take Dr. Redmond two seconds. He said, we're going to have a national, international Chess Educator of the Year Award. And there you go. Here we are today. Uh, we've had, uh, I believe, eight now. Uh, Jim. So um, we've grown here in the library. UTT's grown. The chess program has grown. And certainly under, under Jim's guidance and the fabulous students that we have here that they just happen to have an extraordinary knack and talent for playing competitive chess, as you would all know. Um, recently, uh, McDermott Library became the official archive of the UTD ch chess program. Uh, in the last week, uh, we established the beginning of our online digital archive uh, of the UT Dallas Chess Program. Now, it's located on our website under Treasures at UT Dallas. Uh, you're, you're welcome. I have a handout back there because I know you were going to write all this down if you got interested, but it shows you where to go. And it's really in the beginning stages, but this will be where the history of the chess team is uh, we're delighted to have their archive that, that Jim and his staff have trusted uh, us with. So um, uh, the handouts are back there, and they'll show you. Again, it's just beginning. We put a few pictures on there, but it'll be refined. It'll have all kinds of uh, history. Uh, all the uh, winners of this award will be uh, pictured there, et cetera. So uh, on behalf of the library staff, I do thank you and hope you enjoy the uh, upcoming presentation and with that I'll bring introduce uh, Dr. Abby Kratz and she's associate provost here at UT Dallas. Dr. Kratz. Can you hear that? If you can't, is, can you hear this? Okay, that's good. I'm told I have a soft voice. Um, so try for a little enhancement here. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight and to welcome you um, on behalf of the provost, uh, who is the um, person who has sponsored chess at UT Dallas from day one, and actually a little before that. Um, I come from a family that has also sponsored chess at UT Dallas from day one and a little before that, working um, many years ago with Tim Redmond to get this program established here at UTD. So it's doubly delightful for me to be a part of this occasion tonight and to introduce our honoree, Elizabeth Shaughnessy. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about Elizabeth. Okay. 
Our, honors, our, our honoree tonight grew up in Dublin, where she attended University College and became a practicing architect, building schools and hospitals around the world. And this was a vocation that she pursued for many, many years, and might even continue to pursue it, as far as um, I know. Okay. She succumbed to the charms of an American lawyer who went to Ireland to investigate his family roots there. And that was when Elizabeth O'Shaughnessy became Elizabeth O'Shaughnessy Shaughnessy. <laughs> Ms. Shaughnessy's father introduced her to chess when she was five years old. And she played for fun with her brothers and father at home, but says she became serious about chess only when she was in college and joined the chess team. She played in her first chess Olympiad in Lublin, Poland in 1969, and in 1970 became the Irish Chess Women's Champion. After her marriage, she settled with her husband Stephen in Berkeley, California, and raised their family of three children. And she returned to competitive chess in 1998 when she qualified for the Irish Women's Team and went on to play at chess Olympiads at Elista Kalmykia. <laughs> She helped me with that. Istanbul, Slovenia, Italy, and in Germany. The phenomenon that became her Berkeley Chess School began in 1981, when Elizabeth became the volunteer chess teacher at her son's elementary school. One class in that school became several classes in several schools, until Elizabeth realized she could not satisfy alone the need expressed in the area for more chess in yet more schools. The nonprofit Berkeley Chess School was begun. BCS now serves more than 5,000 K through 12 students in more than 120 public and private schools. Its students encompass a wide diversity that includes all girls programs, special needs children, Title I schools, and an international chess exchange program. Elizabeth was elected to the Berkeley School Board in 1984 and continued to serve as a member until 1992. She served as president of the board of Cal Chess from, from 2003 to 2005 and was elected to the board of the U.S. Chess Federation in 2004. In her spare time, she is currently working to find a permanent home for the Berkeley Chess School and is involved in designing studies to demonstrate the value and importance of chess education for the development of schools of skills that contribute to scholarly achievement and to, um, to making contributions to society. Intriguingly, she says, chess is a unique educational tool. What a wonderful guest to have here as our guest, as our chess educator of the year. I'm honored to introduce Elizabeth Shaughnessy to you, and I share your eager anticipation to hear her comments tonight. Uh, good evening. I left a pen here, it's gone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Shaughnessy, and uh, I started the Berkeley Chess School uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we've put down our 29 years. This is our 30th year. And uh, I did start it in my own children's school, and we now have 5,000. Sorry, 5,000. Um, better. Uh, we now have 5,000 5, oh, 5, kids roughly every year, and uh, we are in 100. 30 to 150 schools. So it has it has grown enormously. Um, anyway, I do want to thank you all for coming tonight, and I want to say how honored I feel at receiving this award. Um, the people who've gone before me are very impressive. Uh, I feel not quite so impressive, but uh, I'm delighted to be here and delighted that you think I'm quite so that impressive. So. Um, with, with that, I'd like to tell you where, uh, in a little more detail uh, where it all started, though indeed, um, Dr. Kratz seems to have said an awful lot uh, <laughs> about me when I don't know where she found half of it, but she managed. Um, well, it all started really on a, a train in uh, Central Europe in uh, World War II when a, um, the Lithuanian ambassador to Germany was escaping the Nazis with his wife and son and uh, sought asylum in Dublin, Ireland. 
uh, I uh, and he stayed with my family. Uh, he was uh, he they all three of them were. Um, he was writing the um, to the United States to get a visa to go to the United States, and it was eighteen months later when that visa finally came through. So we had them quite a while, and they were wonderful. But what? relevant to this uh, is that my brother and I watched my father and this this uh, ambassador play chess every night and it was we were just glued to it we just uh, we were very small but nonetheless it was absolutely fascinating for us to watch these two men who didn't speak very much during the course of the the game but it was they were clearly totally absorbed and involved and we loved both men and and it was really wonderful to watch the other amusing thing, in a way, is that uh, um, in our family's chess, uh, it was a, a gentlemanly game where you said, uh, check to the queen, if that was appropriate. And if you made a blunder, you were allowed to take it back. Because the idea was to win a, a game, a good game, not to win a game just because somebody blundered. But it would show who the better player is if you won a proper game, not a game where somebody didn't notice their queen is on pre. Uh, but anyway, that's the way it was, and that's the way I thought chess was uh, for years. And then I went to college and got on the college team and realized, no, that's not the way chess is played at all. And I was uh, sort of shocked in the beginning and thought, oh, my goodness. Uh, but um, I realized after a while that it was uh, really a purer form of the game. If you, if you blunder, if you make a mistake, you uh, pay the consequences of that mistake, just like you do in life. And so... Uh, so I grew to like that system. Uh, I was studying architecture at, uh, at, in college, and uh, when I graduated, I went to uh, what was then uh, Yugoslavia, and uh, Tito was still alive in those days. And uh, I, I stayed with a group of uh, graduate students and uh, other architectural grad stu graduate students and other students from around the world, and we uh, helped to build new Belgrade. That's not that Belgrade was gone, it wasn't gone, but they had the foresight to not knock down their old city, but to build, when their population increased, to build a, a new city called New Belgrade. And that's what I was doing in Belgrade. But I was also playing chess, of course, in, in uh, Belgrade and throughout, I, I traveled throughout Yugoslavia at the time. Um, and it was, uh, it was fascinating for me, I mean, it really, Almost everybody in Yugoslavia seemed to play chess, and not did they just play, but they played it well. And that was, that really, I mean, I would watch games I would barely understand, and I thought, I want to, I want to do that. I want to be that good. So uh, when I went back to Ireland, I, I qualified for the, um, for the, uh, to be on the Irish women's chess team to play in the, my first Olympiad in Lublin in Poland. And that, I believe, is the last all-women's uh, uh, Olympiad. They used to have an Olympiad for women and an Olympiad for a mixed Olympiad uh, open, where, which was mostly men. Uh, but that was the last one. But it was a great experience for me, and I, I enjoyed it enormously. And I played there in 1969. Uh, following that was, uh, well, I, when I got back to Ireland then, something I learned at that Olympiad, uh, the Soviet Union was still alive and well, and of course very, very, very strong chess players. And the, you know other countries that are now play on their own in Olympiads were then playing for the Soviet Union. So they were extremely strong. But I noticed that uh, oh, it was also the time of adjournments. We adjourned games in those days. So I noticed that uh, when... Uh, when we'd have an adjourned game, uh, we'd be staying up all night going over the, the thing and trying to find a, a good continuation. And uh, the, they'd be all in bed asleep and uh, have a crew of grandmasters going through the whole thing for them. And that didn't seem fair. But I also noticed that um, they were really involved in physical exercise every bit as much as they were in studying chess. They spent as much time and making sure they were fit, and uh, as they did studying chess, and I thought that that's interesting, because it was obvious to me that we of the West, uh, Europe, I was paying for Ireland at the time, uh, were flagging after five hours of play, and they weren't. And so 
that's why they were doing it. So when I came back to Ireland, I started a, a regime of physical fitness for myself, and I became Irish Women's Champion that year, of course, due to the fact that I was physically fit. But, and, and it may have had something to do with it, I'm sure it did. But I say it to the kids today, you know, they go together, the mind and the body go together. You can't separate one from the other. You can't have a great mind without having a, a, a strong body. And uh, that's where I learned that lesson. Uh, so it then, uh, that was 1970 that I became Irish Women's uh, Chess Champion, which is before a lot of you were born. And then in 71, I met my husband and uh, we, I came and uh, settled in California, Berkeley, California, and I've been there ever since. Um, I uh, didn't continue to play chess while the children were in, uh, in the developmental stage. Uh, but I did, uh, but one day uh, the principal of their elementary school came and asked me if, uh, you know, he, he went to the PTA and asked parents if they wouldn't do something after school for the children. So I thought, well, I, I can do chess. And, and uh, my son Stephen was, uh, showed some talent for it. He was in the first grade. And I thought, you know, I'll go and, go and teach the, the kids chess. And I expected half a dozen kids. 72 kids showed up that day, and they were half girls and half boys, 50%. I've never reached that since, but 50% girls, and the, they were all ethnicities, and I was just, I was shocked in a delighted way that, you know, chess, something I knew already, chess is all around the world, it's e everywhere, but it didn't seem to be in America very much. So... So, of course, I, I couldn't, well, the, the day of the 72 kids, I think I had enough boards and sets for 10. Uh, so it was a bit chaotic that day. And so I divided them in two, got more sets and boards, got two demo boards, and, uh, and taught twice a week. Uh, and then another school asked. That was three times a week. And then another school asked four times a week, then five times a week, then six times a week. Well, there were only five school days in the week. So I devised the notion that I will go to the I go to the um, to the chess club and see if I can get any of my fellow chess players to teach the kids uh, I will go to the parents to the PTA and see if the parents are willing to pay for the classes and that way I'll be able to pay the, the my chess playing friends and the kids will be able to have chess and it will all work out very very well which is uh, exactly what happened um, but I also added uh, some money to the charge to the parents who could afford to pay to pay for the kids who couldn't afford to pay. So, so um, and nobody, that was, that was fine with everybody, and I was able to include everybody in, in the classes. Uh, we went from, I mean, the, the, the struggle always was, and still is to this day, finding suitable teachers, finding people who have that sort of time. Uh, they have to be either people with their own businesses and flex, fle uh, flexible schedules, or artists, or actors, or so somebody who, who uh, musicians, people who work at night and can teach an hour a day. Um, so it's it's always difficult, and it was difficult then too. Um, we have over the years managed to uh, build up a cadre of. Uh, excellent teachers who, who just teach chess, but we'll go into how we manage to make it something of a living um, in a, in later on in the speech. Um, anyway, it grew and it grew until uh, we were uh, in outlying regions in the San Francisco Bay Area, and today we are in, in um, the 5,000 kids in 150 schools and growing. And it is, it's amazement to me because you can see I started it as the mother of a young child just doing what mothers do, volunteering in the classroom, and never, never imagined that it would be like this. This is a photograph of uh, Oxford School, the elementary school where uh, I first went, where my kids were going, where we first taught the kids. And you can see that the chess board and set aren't what we use today. <laughs> and, and it was, it was, um, it was the start. Um, the other things we do uh, in uh, the Berkeley Chess School, or what we do in the Berkeley Chess School, is we we do um, uh, in school classes. Uh, we do after school classes. Uh, the after the in school is um, is in the school in the children's classroom during the school day, so they do not self select to take chess. 
we go in and they get chess whether they like it or not. And this is particularly um, useful because it, in getting girls, because they a lot of uh, girls, the ratio of girls signing up for after school classes to boys signing up to after school classes is at best 75 25. Go into the classroom, you've got a 50 50. And they, as I say, they don't choose to do it. That's what they're doing for that hour. And, uh, and, you know, we reach them. And once they learn it, and once they have a critical mass of themselves, enough girls in the class, uh, it works. And they, they learn chess and they get, learn to like chess and they learn to be, get, get good at chess and they learn to, uh, secretly delight when they beat the boys who always think they can beat them. What else we do? We do in school, um, after school, we do uh, tournaments. We do over 20 tournaments a year, uh, not counting the adult tournaments we do. And we run uh, uh, all girls tournaments also, uh, two all girls tournaments a year. Um, we also, well, we, we have a Berkeley Bishops traveling team. It's not a traveling team, it's a team. It's an elite team of all the best kids of all the schools we teach in. It goes from third grade up. And so in the, in the beginning of the school year, we send out notice anybody who wants to compete to be on this team in all these schools where one should come in and play on a certain day. And we hold a, a qualifying uh, tournament and whoever, they're all on the Berkeley Bishops team, but obviously the top is, is, is the real team. And um, this team, we play matches in the area, but we also travel We've had, we've been to Ireland twice now. This is, this is a picture of, uh, the Bishop's team in Ireland with, uh, Grandmaster Alex Baboran in front of, uh, Malahide Castle in, outside of Dublin. And that was, uh, the second time we went to Ireland. And this summer we hope to go to, we were planning to go to Suffolk in England to a school there that has a strong chess team. Of course, the idea, my idea behind this is as much a cultural exchange as it is chess. Chess is the common language, but I really want the children to meet children from other countries and other nationalities in their countries and see, uh, take Ireland, for instance, they speak with a different sort of accent and they speak English sort of a little funny, but they're still nice guys. They, they, they play a, a game called Hurley, which isn't the same game as they play, but it's still a fun game. I, I really think that it's important for us all to get to know how other people live differently from the way we live, and still, they're very nice people. So uh, that's really what's behind it. And chess is the common language. And they play a match. One, one is black and one is white, and everybody hopes everyone will win. But that's the purpose is more of a, a cultural exchange. And I found it to be successful. Uh, actually, the other way around, it's successful too, because the children in Ireland imagine America to be um, uh, Dallas. That's a that's a program, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, and of course, what we bring over are uh, coming from California is a whole mixed ethnicity of children coming from everywhere in the world, um, or being uh, of that ethnicity. So that's a shock for them. Uh, so it, it works both ways, and when they come over here, it works works for them too. So we also have, uh, we do simultaneous exhibitions, and this is a photograph of um, a man, he's 18 years old, and his name is John Ludwig Hammer, and he's a grandmaster now, he's 19. And John learned chess from the Berkeley Chess School. He's, his father was a, a, a visiting professor at uh, Cal, at the University of California at Berkeley, and he was there for three or four years during John and his sister's elementary school, and they took chess from the Berkeley Chess School to the elementary school, and he now is, he was our first alumni grand, alumni grandmaster, alumnus grandmaster, and when he comes, when they visit, he usually comes over and uh, does a sign for the kids, which is, is great for them. Uh, we also do um, winter camps and summer camps, and uh, I don't know why they chose this photograph. I guess to show the chess can be fun. Uh, I would have had them all with straight faces, but okay. And uh, we also do adult chess. Uh, the idea behind the adult, well, what we do is an adult chess tournament, and every Friday evening uh, we have a class from five thirty to six. We have. Uh, six to eight sections, in other words, six to eight levels of children who come and are taught at those levels. And, and then we, um, we, uh, oh, yeah. uh, oh, yes, I know. And so, uh, 
But we also have, at 7 o'clock, a tournament starts for the children. And um, also at 7 o'clock, a tournament starts for adults. And so the kids who have won the kids' tournament X number of times and have got their little trophies are getting pretty tired of this because they don't, it isn't competition for them. So they play in the adult tournament where they, where they are challenged. Uh, we have uh, master and feeder masters play in our uh, adult tournaments and, and international masters. So they get a good run for their money, but they seldom play them. Huh? Oh yes, we do, thank you. We do have a seven-year-old who, uh, who just won the national championship in the second grade, uh, and in Florida, wasn't it, recently? And uh, he, um, he comes in and gives them a good run for their money. He wins quite a number of games because, of course, in a Swiss system, he's not going to be playing the top all the time. But he's the terror of the adult chess. Adult, the adult chess, the idea behind the adult chess also is uh, our instructors come from all walks of life. And as you heard, it's hard to get instructors. So if I have somebody coming in and they've played casual chess or they play on the, on the uh, ICU or whatever, but they haven't joined the USCF and they don't have a rating and nobody knows whether they're good or bad, uh, I can play them a game and maybe they're not very good. Uh, I know I can send in somebody who knows how to play chess and to teach small children how the pieces move, so I know I can use that person, but I'd really like that person to be a better chess player. So I, free of charge, they play in the adult tournament every Friday night, and that way they get better at chess, and they begin to realize uh, how little they know. They come in to me thinking they're pretty good, and after a while they realize not so good, and then they begin to study a bit, and they get to be better chess players and enjoy the game more themselves, of course, because the better you are, the more you're going to enjoy it. So the uh, and the adult club, of course, also meets the needs of adults in the community who want somewhere to play uh, chess person to person. Uh, while all while all this was going on, um, as uh, the person who introduced me said, I was in, in my spare time. I was uh, elected to the Berkeley School Board, and I was on the Berkeley School Board. Uh, I was elected twice, so I was on it for eight years. And in the course of those eight years, I talked with educators all over the state about various uh, um, enrichments and um, interventions that can be done with all sorts of things, including chess. And it was uh, it was enlightening to me how various districts were trying various things and how chess was is somehow looked upon as the uh, intellectual entertainment of the elite. It's, it's seen that way in this country for some reason. And so it's hard to get across to educators that it's not just a game. It actually is a, a unique tool for children to help them with their school things. So it's, it's really hard to get that across. And that is why we're doing studies. And as you are here, I understand, uh, to try and show that that's the case. Um, I also went uh, played for the Irish women's team in uh, a number of tournaments in Bled in Slovenia and in Istanbul in Turkey and in here's here's uh, a list in Kalmykia and the one in the middle is um, is uh, Candy Mansisk in Siberia where I was last fall and it was a wonderful uh, Olympiad it was um, it was one of the best I've been to it was quite amazing. Uh, Siberia itself, it wasn't cold at all. Uh, no snow. No snow in Siberia in, uh, in October. And uh, it, it was just amazing. Uh, not, not particularly beautiful um, scenery, but, uh, but great people and really, really nice. I also played in the uh, European Championship in Neon. Uh, it was the only European Championship I've ever played in. They are really very, very hard. Um, and I also uh, I, I got I got elected to the United States Chess Federation um, um, executive board, and I, I represented the United States in, as a delegate uh, at the Olympiad in Calvia. I didn't play in that one, and that was interesting too to see the politics and and uh, the uh, money behind the whole FIDE and the whole chess world, because um, money does rule. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, uh, yes, I, oh, sorry, yes, I was Cal Chess president uh, for two years, uh, which 
reminds me of an interesting phenomenon in my life, and I wonder what it is about me that causes this to happen. But when I got on the Berkeley School Board, it was it had just gone into receivership. So they were broke, and we were elected to get them out of broke. And, uh, uh, and of course, the former board were just dismissed, and we were elected to do this. And we did it in one year. One year we got out of receivership, which was really quite amazing. Um, and it was a good thing, because when you're in receivership, you have to hire somebody to come in and, and oversee you, and that person gets paid almost as much as you're in debt. So if you get, get rid of that person, you have a much better bottom line. And then the uh, the United States Chess Federation, when I got in, was uh, was had been broke a few years before that and was still struggling to get out of the red and into the black. And thanks really to Beatrice Marinello, uh, but also those of us on the board who supported her, uh, we were, by the time I left the USCF, we were in the black. And I find it just heartbreaking that we're back into the red again, because it was, it was, an, it was quite a struggle to get back into the black again. We had to lay off a lot of people. Um, it was it was hard, but we did it. Uh, and then uh, when I became president of Cal Chess, I think I was there a year when our treasurer went off with all our money, $62,000. He just stole $62,000 from us. And uh, I spent a whole year with attorneys and in court and uh, doing this and that and got every single penny back. So so my experience of these things seems to be that they... Um, they go broke and I come in, but, <laughs> but that just happens to be by coincidence because certainly in the case of the USCF, it, it was uh, assisting Beatrice and not, not something I did. And there was a, a, a Tim Hankey was the treasurer at the time and he was terrific too. It was, it was hard, but we, we did it. Okay. Um, here, here's an example of, um, I just took some photographs of, or found some photographs on the internet, uh, of chess being played throughout the world. Because it's impressive to me that uh, in India, Budapest, Cuba, and Indonesia, uh, it certainly isn't an intellectual pastime for the elite. Uh, everybody plays chess, and I find this all over the world. Everybody plays chess. I remember uh, being in uh, in Bali, and uh, the uh, man who took the tourists out, me included, for snorkeling, uh, while the tourists were snorkeling, they were playing chess on the boat to to put in their time. It's played everywhere. You go to Hawaii, it's on the, it's on the um, beaches there. It's just everywhere. I'd like to see it that way here. It's, it's getting there. It's getting there. But I'd like to see it here a lot faster. Um, OK, then uh, in, in 1996, the superintendent of a school district neighboring us, it's the Emory School District, and the town is called Emeryville. And uh, the school population there is 99% on free lunches. It is uh, a very, very poor school district. And uh, he invited us in to do chess during the school day for the kids. Uh, and he got the money. Emmyville is also a very rich town. It has uh, lots of um, uh, businesses there. Chiron is there and a lot, a lot of businesses you would recognize. Uh, but th that money doesn't go to the schools. So the superintendent went around anyway and got these people to give money to have chess into the schools, which was, was great. And we went in and, um, it was my, it was my first time doing chess during the school day with this uh, type of population of children. And I realized that, you know, the Berkeley Chess School has been going now for quite a while, but we're missing out on this population of children. And my system of, you know, the parents pay and I pay the teachers doesn't work in this case. So I'll have to start thinking up some way of, of getting, somebody is going to have to pay to bring chess to these children. And um, what we did here was the, the, um, the, the, the elementary school went from being a school at risk to a school of merit in the three years we were there teaching in the elementary school. And I'm sure it wasn't just chess that did that, but I'm sure also that chess had a, had an influence. Uh, those children then went on to the middle school in, in Emeryville, where they came forth in the state. Now, these are children who have no enrichment in their lives, but maybe that's why chess was so special to them, and they really um, studied it and played it and uh, were determined to, to win, and they, they did very, very well. And one child, the ch this this child here, uh, his, oh, this one. His name is uh, Major Castleberry. He he came first in the in the uh, in the state in his section, the K six section, 
and um, from that he got a scholarship to a, uh, a private school in uh, in Oakland, and from there he went to um, St. Mary's School in Moraga, where he is now studying philosophy. So uh, a lot of this is attributable to the fact that he uh, learned chess and learned to to concentrate and so. From there, we went to, uh, from there, I, as I said, somebody was going to pay for it. So I went around and I got the money to go into a school in Richmond, J.O. Ford School in Richmond. And this was a group of uh, um, new, new immigrants, new immigrant children. Uh, and, uh, who, and again, this was a Title I school. This was a school, free lunches, uh, you know, 80% or more free lunch, kids with free lunch. So it was a school that needed something like this. And we went in there and we taught chess in there. And we did a study that year too. And if I could find my piece of paper, the study here showed the percentages, the percentages that the children um, increased over over the children who did not have chess. But apart from the percentages, which were 11, 15, and 19, I think, percent over the course of the year for, for various California tests. Um, but what's interesting is these kids are going up. However, gradually they're going up, and and these kids are not. But our kids are, are improving. every every. This is in the course of one year. Uh, some st standardized California tests. So, um, so we were very heartened with this. We knew we were on the right track. And, um, but uh, this study, the the Richmond study, was uh, one t one school, and uh, we decided we needed more than one school. So we went into Oakland, and we went into five schools in Oakland, and again, five Title I schools. In the areas, I don't know if you get news out here of the uh, shootings in Oakland, but that's where they live. So these children, when they go home, really can't, can't leave because it's not safe. That's the, that's the sort of lives they have. They don't even have PE as an enrichment in their, in their school. Um, but they, now they have chess. And, uh, as you can see, this is a, we hold a tournament for those five schools at the end of the year, and you can see these children are very happy with their medals and their and their um, trophies. Uh, really, very happy. Well, we got an outside firm to do a study for this school, also for this uh, school also, or the five schools, not this school, this project, and uh, we we found that for the students who had twenty more twenty or more hours of chess. Uh, in the year, it would uh, did significantly better in their math than the children who did not. Now, I want to say here at this point that uh, twenty hours twenty hours means twenty weeks. We only go in one hour a week. That's all there is. It's really incredibly inexpensive and and uh, cost effective way of spending the few dollars we have for education. So, and, and we've just gone into five, six, six more schools in Richmond, California, uh, this time six schools in Richmond, California, and that's just started just a couple of weeks before I came out, so I just wanted to show you the picture. Okay, and um, there he is. Uh, the other, uh, chess, so I've talked about the, the, uh, most of the kids in public school, and I've talked about the kids at risk in public school, and I, I found that 20% uh, uh, of the high school dropouts in the country uh, have been tested as gifted. 20% have been tested as gifted, and they are dropping out of school. And you wonder why, and then you examine the, the school system, and you realize that, well, uh, in your regular school system, you're in second grade, and that's where you stay, in second grade. And it's too bad if you're really performing at fourth grade level because you stay in second grade. And it's teachers have it hard enough besides having you in the class. So for a while, the student is, is put teaching another student maybe to you know occupy him, but he's not being taught, he or she. But this, is, um, this isn't right, whilst chess you don't expect a child who is rated a thousand to keep playing the child who is rated five hundred and give them some chess lessons and consider that you're educating them. You you put him against the child who is his equal if you can, and and 
that is, this is why I bring the seven-year-old in to do the, the, the adult tournament. That's where he's at. That's where he's at. And it challenges him. And he's, he's not going to be, um, he's not going to be bored. So I think chess has a way of reaching children at, at all levels. In the, in the school in Richmond, before I get onto that, in the school in Richmond, the, the uh, bilingual school we went into, the Spanish speaking school, um, there were two brothers, and they were troublemakers par excellence. I mean, they just, you, even for the chess teacher when he went in, uh, he um, he had trouble with these children, these two boys. And as we might expect, after a while, we managed to get them to get interested in chess. And they were ADDD, ADD kids and were always in trouble, always in the office, always causing trouble. Well, by the end of the year, they weren't just good chess players, but they were good students. And the teacher just could not believe the transformation that had been made of these two boys. Um, these two boys were, were gifted boys, and they were acting out because they had nothing else to do. What are boys supposed to do? They're going to act out. So chess meets the, these, these needs of these very gifted children as well. So here we have the chess the theory of change. Um, when I go out for funds for uh, these Title I schools I go into, I'm often asked, well, what is it about chess that makes it so special? Is it the same as art or music or anything else we might bring in? And I believe that chess is unique. I'm not against art or music, it's wonderful. But uh, chess, it's an enjoyable game. and. The children have no resistance whatsoever to playing a game. You have them from, right from the beginning. And it's, uh, that's, that makes it easy. And a unique thing about chess, again, is that the child is in control of the game. The child owns the game. He has created the game. It is his game. Uh, and he can do with it what he wants. And the result of this control and this ownership of the game means he has to uh, as deal with and accept the consequences if he loses he has lost if he wins he has won it isn't it isn't my partner it isn't the teacher it isn't my mother it's it's me they have ownership of a game if you think about children children almost never have ownership of anything they're told what to do they're told what to practice they do it but they don't have ownership of it a game of chess this is their creation uh it's exciting for adults too, but it's we have ownership of maybe a lot of things. They don't, and and it's so it's it's new. It's competition. Kids love competition. Competition is important in life. It's important to know what to do when you lose. Uh, you what do you do? You lie down in your diary. You get up and you fight again. And um, with girls, I find uh, that. Uh, their reaction to it is often to say, oh, that's a boring game and walk away. So they don't deal with failure, with losing a game for as well as the boys do, maybe because the boys start life kicking a ball through, uh, through a, a goal and uh, to, through two poles and they win or lose. And the girls often start off life playing house and with dolls where there's no winning and losing. So maybe, maybe, I don't know. but. Um, uh, it, it, it improves their ability to focus. Anybody who has uh, taught a child or has a child playing chess, or e indeed ourselves, we understand that you can't play chess without focusing. Just can't. Whilst you can sit in class and goof off, but you can't play a game of chess and get the pleasure out of it and own it and, and hope to win and learn uh, without focusing. So they focus. And I think that was the principal secret of these two boys is that they suddenly focused on what the teacher was saying. And if you listen to what your teacher is saying, you're going to learn. It develops memory and critical thinking and creativity. We all know that. It teaches patience. Uh, they have to play slower. They have to think things through. And uh, this combination of improved cognition and behavior ends up boosting student achievement. So that's the theory of change. I we're back to the Berkeley Chess School today. We have state champions since we started competing in 1986. We've had state champions every single year. Uh, uh, of course, it can be said we've an awful lot of kids too, so no wonder, but we do. Uh, we have a FIDE master, uh, alumnus and international master, two grandmasters, and one world champion under 18. It was Sam Shankland. That's where we are today. 
Now, there's another aspect which some of you may be interested in uh, of the Berkeley Chess School, and it is the um, how do we train our teachers? I've told you the problem of getting teachers, they're not always the best chess players. Sometimes they're not always the best at keeping order in the classroom. Uh, we have to, they have to be trained. So we, I have lesson plans, which I give them. That's, that's step one. Step two is we have workshops. And uh, they are supposed to show a lesson at the workshop. So they get the lesson plans. They're supposed to come and show us a lesson. Meantime, they are supposed to or will have observed uh, some of our best teachers teach on, on the, this Friday night, where there's a choice of all these sections. So they can watch teachers who have different styles teach and realize what, what's their style. They don't have to, there isn't any one style for teaching children. So they observe this, they have their lesson plans, and they come to the workshop and they show us. And we, um, we critique what they've done and what they haven't done. Uh, and this goes on. And then we also, um, send them in to, to assist a teacher before we throw them to the wolves to, with their own class. So they go in and they assist and they see there. And at that stage, some of them quit, but a lot of them don't, and they're learning all the time. Then they take their own class. And once they have their own class, we go out and observe that too and critique and tell them how they might help. We always emphasize to them at workshops that we are here to help them get become better teachers, not to find out what they're doing wrong. So if they have a problem, they have to call the office and tell us about the problem so that we can help them with the problem. Sometimes they will have a child in the class who's impossible and it's impossible to teach him. And my thought about that is, well, he's too young, he's not mature enough yet. So we call the parents and say, you know, Johnny's a bright kid, but he seems to be not mature enough and he's causing trouble in the classroom, maybe next year. And I, and I give back the money to the parents and I have never had a parent who, who said, oh, no, no, Johnny was right and you're wrong. Uh, one, they're getting their money back, but two, you can be sure that we're not the only ones telling them that Johnny is a problem. You're sure the classroom teacher is telling them that too. So, so that's, but if the teacher doesn't tell us that and is dealing with a class where Johnny is ruling the whole class, you've lost them all. You've taught nothing. I also say to my teachers that if the child hasn't learned, it doesn't mean that the child can't learn. It means that you haven't taught and you do it again. So I'm hard on my teachers, maybe. Um, I want to show you some teachers, however, that uh, I'm not hard on. This is Sam Shanton, who comes back and teaches for us. This is David Pruess, uh, International Master David Pruess, who now works for chess.com. Uh, this is uh, a Video master Andy Lee, who's a high school teacher, but comes and teach for us Friday night sometimes or uh, for our summer camp. Here we have um, uh, guest instructors, uh, and this is John Ludwig Hammer when he was a, a Berkeley bishop. He's now a grandmaster. He was the one who did the simul a while, I showed you a while back. This is Julio Kaplan, who was a um, uh, youth champion in, of, yeah, of the world in his day. And this is Walter Brown. Many people have asked me about Grandmaster Walter Brown. He lives in Berkeley up the street from us. And he comes down and does a simul with the kids from time to time. And that's that's really nice. Um, here are guest masters we have for our summer camp especially. Uh, this was from England, Grandmaster Danny King. Uh, uh, Stuart Conquest was British champion, but he lives in Spain, but he came over and taught for us. And uh, Marcel Cisniega, Grandmaster Marcel Cisniega lives in Mexico. Uh, they came in and worked for us. Uh, Irina Crush, we all know, I think, is uh, she's currently a um, uh, woman champion of the United States, and she's an international master, and she's very strong. Great teacher. Uh, Sam Collins is Irish. He's a friend of mine. He's also a gold medalist in the Olympiad uh, in Bled. He, he won it. And he's, he's uh, two norms. David Pruess has two norms, too. He's waiting for his third, trying to get his third grand master norm. Uh, and this summer, we've invited uh, Verusia Nakobian to come teach for us. And Alex Baborn from uh, Grandmaster Alex Baborn is coming over, too, for our summer camp. Our, our summer camps are seven, seven weeks long. And um, we, the, these men will not be there for the whole seven weeks. We couldn't afford that. But they'll be there for in all four, two each. Uh, this is my good friend, George Kotonowski, who is unfortunately deceased now. Uh, George was really an inspiration for me when I was starting off the, the, the school. And uh, he was on our first board of directors. We're a non-profit. And he, he was just so supportive and so, so helpful of me. I remember once he came and did a signal at... Um, 
at Oxford, and that's the first school I went into. And he, um, I remember a little kid this size looking up at me and saying, but I can beat him, he's old. <laughs> And I thought you're going to learn a lesson today, <laughs> and of course George beat them all. So here we have Jordi Moreno and Vinay Bhatt with me. Uh, Jordi was uh, beat Bobby Fischer's um, uh, record, and Vinay beat Jordi's record. I think a year later, but uh, they um, Vinay is now at GM, and uh, Jordi is at school in Stanford. Um, here we have Jim Morris Ashley. Uh, he came to uh, Oakland to play uh, the kids, and uh, one of our kids actually drew with him, which was really quite an achievement. We were very delighted with that. And here are some friends you meet, or people you meet, as you play chess. So chess, it's thought of as a, you know, a solo person, you're just there all on your own. But in fact, chess is very sociable. You meet a lot of people. Um, you've gone too fast. I haven't been able to. <laughs> uh, well, I think we all know Susan Polgar, uh, and uh, well, maybe you don't. That's Susan Polgar. That was the year before I got elected to the um, to the United States Chess Federation. Before I was elected, uh, California Governor Ch Jerry Brown was uh, there when I got the uh, Bank of America award. And here we have uh, uh, Gary and, and I in um, Bled, Slovenia, having a. A good time. Um, and then here's, here's some uh, recognitions and awards we got from Congress and from um, the East. The um, Diablo magazine said we were the best after school um, uh, in the Bay Area, class in the Bay Area. And this was from the Berkeley School, Bo school District uh, thanking us for our work. Uh, here, Valero, the oil company, has given us $12,000. And uh, the Berkeley, uh, the Bank of America, that was. Uh, uh, yeah, the Bank of America was the one that um, Jerry Brown, yes, we met Jerry Brown. And this uh, magic award, it was from the Avanti Foundation, and uh, it was given, it was handed to me, the check was handed to me by Senator Bob Dole. Um, so uh, the uh, Valero contribution you saw was for uh, a, f a future home of the Berkeley Chess School. So we have a, a capital campaign going on now for the future home of the Berkeley Chess School, which we hope will be a center for chess on the West Coast uh, for all, for everybody, and and also uh, for um, educational references. So educators can come and see studies and see, there are lots of studies done as we all know already by lots of people. So that's that's what we're up to right now. And uh, if you want to stay in touch, uh, this is our email address. But I do want to say to the students here that uh, you can go out and, uh, and uh, teach chess and do a huge amount of good for the world. Or you can go out and make lots of money and give some of that money to those of us who are in fact trying to do something good in the world. So, and thank you very much for coming and I hope I didn't bore you too much and now I'm open to questions. Can I answer a few questions? Yeah. On the games that you showed, were those the after school program kids that did better on tests or was that the in school? That was in school. Those were the in school yeah. comparisons? Yeah, there's, there's no point really, at least I feel there's no point in doing a test. It, these, these things cost, it costs a lot of money to get an outside firm to come in and do a test. So I want it to be an effective test. And if at after school the children are mostly self chosen, they ch that negates the test. It has to be random. So, in school is the only way to do, uh, uh, and even in school it becomes terribly complicated. But it's if some chance, because the children are there whether they like it or not, they haven't chosen to be there, the classes are chosen whether the teachers like them or not, they haven't chosen to do. I mean, you get a, you get a, a Classes who have it and classes who don't, okay. and who's going to get it is anyone's guess. So it was, it was randomized. So it's it? randomized. Okay. Yeah. That's what but the after school, you, no, no, no. you don't because it, it, you know, it costs too much money to do these studies to, to sort of waste it. You've got to try, and, and even then, you're, you know, it's it's hard. But uh, we're, we're continuing with our studies, and we plan to continue for years to come yet with our study. But I hear the University of Dallas of Texas. Uh, Texas and Dallas, rather, are doing amazing studies. We're trying. 
with the, with the brain, you know, the, the, uh, the brain of the masters and so on. And part, so between us, if we can get all these studies together, maybe we get the educators to actually put some money <coughs> into bringing in a tool that you that works for these kids. We're all supposed we're all so concerned about how we're not reaching a lot of our children. Here, here's a way to do it. And it's cheap. It's cheap. It's so cheap. You know? <laughs> but, but there you are. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask you a question. Um, how many uh, chess instructors does the Berkeley School have, and how do you select and promote and reward uh, those people? Well, we have we have roughly between it varies, but between forty and sixty um, instructors out there in the field. Uh, part of it, part of our uh, solid um, bunch of teachers is because I have been able to get in school, and so I have they have a day's work. Go into a school, go to the in school, go to these schools in the morning. First thing you go through classroom, classroom, classroom. Then you teach your after school class. And you can do that day after day, and that's it creates something like a job. Uh, the uh, it's a hard job. <laughs> it's it's a job. You can actually live on that sort of money. Um, uh, so the other part of it was how do I reward them? I give them more money. Uh, I pay them more, and more classes. So that it becomes more of a job, and there was a, a third aspect to your question. Well, I, you know, the other issue has been we. How do I have, find them? I think. It yeah, uh, yeah. How do you recruit them? And we found that one of the issues for us has been there are people who know a lot about chess, uh, but they're not the kind of role model you want to put in front of kids. So what do you do to kind of weed out the people who may well, not? We be? interview everybody before we do anything. We interview people, and we weed them out right there. Now, sometimes we miss it. And it becomes very evident as the first day of class, we get a call from the school saying, you know, the children are running wild. <laughs> and and we know we've, you know we've made a mistake. But we keep on top of it as best we can, and we're fairly successful. We, we have these disasters, but not, not very many. Um, and how do we find them? We advertise for them on Craigslist, among other, other places. And we get, there are a lot of people who play chess who aren't members of the United States Chess Federation. We have the list of the people. You know, we always approach them. You know, you can buy those lists from the U.S. Yeah. and we send out things to them. For, I do for both to play in the adult tournament and the, you know, for other things and to teach. But Craigslist is a good way, and you get you get people who can play chess and can't can't teach kids. You get people who can teach kids and can't play chess, and then rarely you get one who can do both. Uh, and so it's up to you to train them, and that's why. The ones who don't play chess very well, I, I say you got to play chess on Friday nights and with the adult tournament. And the ones who can't uh, control children um, mostly can be taught. Sometimes I have them; like, they just can't be taught. They think they know it. And a mistake among we're 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 in Berkeley, where the University of Berkeley is. So we have these students, uh, and um, I've had these students some of them come down and they think they're going in as a friend of the kids, they're, that they're one of the kids and they're not one of the kids and they never will be one of the kids and the kids don't see them as one of the kids. But because they see themselves in that role and don't want to be not nice to the kids, uh, they create this atmosphere of total chaos and it can never be won back. <laughs> not by that person, it has to be won back then by, by some other way. So, yeah. I'm sure you have exactly the same type of problem. It's human nature, but you just have to keep being on top of it and, uh, and emphasize, we emphasize again and again that if the teachers have a problem, please let us know because we can, in fact, solve the problem. Uh, and if they're not saying, I can't do the job when they call up, they're saying, I can do the job and I have a problem. And uh, so if we, if we work hard. I have a, uh, I have a, um, an office staff of five people. You say, well, what on earth are they doing? They're doing the paperwork for one thing that need, needs to be done to go into the school districts. It's enormous, enormous. I understand I was talking with somebody today and uh, that California is much more stringent uh, things to do than, than Texas has, but it's, it's just it's just huge. And then answering phone calls and dealing with parents, and it's, it's a job. Very time consuming. Yes. I noticed that you, as an instructor, you're still playing in tournaments from time to time. Yeah. 
My oh, notion is structured anymore. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I do play a tournament sometimes. Right, right. How important do you think is being competitive, being active as a chess player in teaching, in your teaching career? As best you teach children? Is it I'm, I'm not sure it's hugely important. I, I play chess because I love chess. I'm not that good a chess player. I don't have any time to study. Uh, but I enjoy chess so much, I, I just play it. Um, I have teachers teach for me who have who are masters. A lot of men do this, and they don't play again because if they play again, they might lose it. And they're excellent chess players, but they don't play competitively anymore. And they're excellent teachers. Do you think if you put more time in, you know, creating lesson plans and teaching the kids, do you think you can be a more successful instructor? Or oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean. My best instructor, uh, I, I see him all the time, and he is, he prepares for every lesson. It's, um, you know, another thing I forgot to say, which I think is hugely important, is um, that uh, you've got to have a high, the highest of expectations for your children. Maybe I've ever been um, uh, And I tell my instructors this from the, from the very beginning, you've got to have the highest expectations of your children. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't want to hear that the kid couldn't do it. I don't want to hear that. But um, I'll give you an example of expectations. This teacher I was just about to talk about, who was so good, reminded me. I went into a classroom that he was teaching, and there was a little boy sitting face with his back to the demonstration board. All the rest of the students were facing the demonstration board, and I thought, it's a strange way. Is he disciplining the child or what? This was a kindergarten and first grade class. That child was playing a blindfold game. And the kids looking at it were telling what the other move was, and, and he was telling what the move was. Now, it wasn't a long, complicated game, but it was a game. And this was a kindergarten and first grade class. Not only that, the rest of the kids were eagerly awaiting their turn to do the same thing. Now, nobody told them that only, only genius, that very few people can play blindfold. Nobody told them that. The teacher said, oh, here's what we do. You memorize this, you think about it, you visualize it, and here, let's try it. And they did it. They did it. Uh, I can't play blindfold chess. They could do blindfold chess because nobody told them they couldn't. And uh, I, I just, the other th thing is um, girls and boys, t girls tournaments. Girls' tournaments are delightful to run. There's never, there's never any problems. Nobody's ever disputing a result. Nobody's ever yelling at everyone for at anyone for not winning. Uh, the girls make friends with their opponents. They go off out in the playground and they play. The fathers beam and say, "Isn't it wonderful? My daughters are playing chess." The the open tournament in which girls can play too, but it's mostly boys. Uh, Fathers are there, and they expect their boys to win, and they expect them uh, not to lose, and they expect them to do what they told them to do the night before, and if they didn't do it, it's, why did you make that move? I told you not to make that move. I told you this was the move in that opening. Why didn't you play it? This is the sort of thing you get. Or, you know, uh, he touched a piece, and, and uh, he, uh, the father would come after the game. Oh, oh, the opponent touched a piece. and So this is what you have. So... Both of these groups of children are, in a way, are disadvantaged. One is there's no expectations that the girls should win, so they don't. There's a huge expectation that the boys would win, and they do. A lot of those boys quit chess, of course, because who needs that? But, but on a more, a more temperate way, the more normal parents, you can see the expectation is for the boys to win, and it's not there for the girls. And if it's, it's expectations, again. And I, I could go on and on, but e expectations are hugely important. And so I, that I say, that's the first thing I say to my teachers, you know, don't expect them to be the best. Yes? Do you know of uh, any vehicle to where we could give the kids something uh, that is organized, that they could take home and learn on their own while they're learning, you know, in, in the classroom? Is there something that they can... We, we give handouts with our lesson plans, so the child goes home after every lesson with, with what he supposedly has learned that day. Uh, that's, there's two reasons for that. Remember, our parents pay, for the most part, for the classes, so they can see what they're paying for. You know, we, this is what we taught today. Go over it with your child if you want to, and don't if you don't. You know, we don't demand um, homework. They have enough of that, God knows, in their lives. Uh, but, uh, and the, the handouts are related to what we teach. Uh, there's, there's some, some great books that you can uh, copy things from. 
Bobby Fischer teaches us is great, but what's the yellow cover book? Yeah, Tactics by Al Wallum, that's it. And he doesn't mind. He, he in fact, encourages people to copy, to, uh, to Xerox the, the thing. It's full of puzzles. And it goes from, uh, you know, the very easy ones to the very hard ones. So you, 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 you know, judge your children and you give out whatever is appropriate. But you can Xerox those and hand them out, and we do. Um, we also have handouts when children... Uh, when children come in to, well, the Friday night especially, they come in, some of them, they, they're straggling in, or in summer camp, they're straggling in, they don't all arrive at the same time. We give them handouts to do while they're waiting. In this uh, uh, big tournament we have for the five schools in Oakland that we do, it's, it's a hu huge tournament, and it's a difficult tournament to control the kids. While they're waiting for the rest of the schools, are bussed into the one school. The kids are bussed into the one school where the tournament is. And while we're waiting, those kids are sitting out with handouts doing puzzles because, hey, it keeps them, keeps them busy and keeps them occupied and keeps them doing what, it keeps them on task, what they're doing. So, <laughs> uh, the, the Polgar book is excellent too for, for uh, puzzles. It goes, uh, it gets pretty hard pretty soon, but for your more advanced kids. Okay, well, thank you very much for your question. And now it's time to present the award of Chess Educator of the Year. forgot about this. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for stimulating us to think more clearly about children and children. Um, what we want to do and want to accomplish in this short time that we have available to be able to accomplish something for our children. Um, it's a privilege to present to you the uh, symbol and the plaque that says that you are the chess educator of the year. Yay.